Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our virtual panel discussion. Today, I'm joined by four of the leading voices in the B2B space to talk about how marketers can survive and thrive in the new normal. I'm going to dive right in and introduce myself as well as our brilliant team of panelists so we can get to the good stuff and tackle all things B2B marketing and growth. My name is Laura Scruggs, and I have the distinct pleasure of being the director of marketing here at MindGrub. We're a full service digital agency and consultancy based in Baltimore, and we specialize in mobile and web development, user experience, interactive design, branding, and digital marketing. I'm joined today first by David Goldner. He's a partner in CPA at Gross Mendelssohn and Associates, a relationship focused regional accounting firm that's been around since 1960. David has been working with business owners for over 40 years and has spent the last 15 overseeing the marketing department at GM. Welcome, David. Thank you. Next up is Becky Smith. She's the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at CQ, Maryland's largest credit union. As both Chief Strategy and Chief Marketing Officer, Becky manages enterprise strategy, marketing, advertising, business intelligence, customer experience, and everything in between. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. Thirdly, we have Erica Starr. She's the Director of Marketing and Senior Vice President at Howard Bank, which is Baltimore's largest independently owned bank. She has a passion for digital marketing and made the 2019 Daily Record VIP 40 Under 40 list. Congratulations and welcome, Erica. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, we have Alex Frederick, who's the Senior District Sales Manager at Toast. Toast, as you might know, is the fastest growing restaurant technology platform and was recently listed at number 10 on Forbes' list of the top 100 privately held cloud companies in the world. Welcome, Alex. Happy to be here. Awesome. So before we dive into our discussion today, I want to kick things off with a quick poll and a couple of housekeeping notes for our attendees. So on your screen in the next couple of seconds, you should see a poll box uh, pop up with a couple of questions. So do take a couple of moments to respond so we can know how to shape our conversation here today. The first question is what's been your marketing pain points since COVID-19? Answer as many as might apply. And two, once the pandemic ends, what marketing project are you most excited to tackle? And I'm excited to see everyone's thoughts on those two questions. I think that will really help us frame our discussion today. A uh, couple of quick housekeeping notes while you're answering. First, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded. And secondly and finally, we encourage you to submit questions for our panelists throughout the discussion today via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and to use the chat box to introduce yourself, share any comments throughout the discussion. Our team will be collecting your questions and sharing as many as time permits with our panelists at the end of the discussion, so around 1.45 or 1.50 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Excellent. So thanks to everyone who shared their feedback of where, where you all are in your B2B growth journeys. As a B2B marketer myself, I think I speak for all of us when I say that while everything has changed, some things may never change. And a lot of these opportunities were ones that have only become more important since the beginning of 2020. Um, so based on the responses so far, I'm quite confident that today's discussion will be highly relevant for everybody here today. And I'm really excited to dig in. Excellent. So as you can see here, a pretty diverse number of pain points here, and everybody is pretty excited for the return of in-person events, myself included, but we'll try to bring some of that energy to today's webinar as well. So to kick off our discussion today, I'd love to talk a little bit about the past nine months or so and how our strategic priorities have changed since the beginning of the year. So I'd love to hear from everyone on this. We'll start with Becky. Um, I'm interested to hear what your major areas of focus were at the beginning of 2020. Have these priorities changed over the last several months or have they not changed at all? Why don't we start with you, Becky, and then we can go around sure. our perspectives. Sure, so um, our plans changed in some areas, um, certainly. And others, um, you know, from a strategic standpoint, we ended up just accelerating some of the things that have been on our plate, you know, to do for so long. But one of the big things that's changed for us at the beginning of the year, we had a big rebrand um, campaign, all queued up, ready to launch on April 1. Um, and you can imagine during that time, it felt a little tone deaf to go to market with a campaign that was all about us um, in a time that we needed to be all about, you know, our members, the community, the small businesses that were really being impacted. So we really had to pivot around 
um, our messaging around what we were putting our media dollars towards and it became more of a doing what's right became the competitive advantage um, for us not our products our solutions but just doing the right thing so we just really pivoted hard towards small business grants and nonprofit grants and and things like that we felt like could impact the community right then and there with the immediate needs versus some of our own long-term objectives that we had for ourselves so that was certainly one area that we had to quickly pivot around I'm sure many of my colleagues have done the same Absolutely. David, why don't you go next? So we, we market to our niches. Um, we have five or six nonprofits, manufacturing, uh, construction, et cetera. And each of those areas markets to their particular group. So we really didn't change the focus of who we were going to market to. Our, our, our change had to do with what information we were giving to them. So over the last few years, we've you know, we've changed from just uh, attending group meetings, et cetera, organizational type stuff to doing a lot of content marketing, a lot of providing information to, uh, you know, the client base, the market that we're trying to reach. So, you know, what we did is, you know, we did five times more blogs in one month than we had done in any month in history and continued that initially is how we were responding, but we were still reaching out to the specific groups that we're always still trying to sell to. Absolutely. And Erica, have your priorities shifted or have they shifted since the beginning of 2020? Yeah, so the beginning of 2020 um, was already going to be uh, an interesting year in banking in Baltimore, uh, just because of the, the amount of acquisitions and mergers that had happened in 2019 in banking uh, here. So we kind of started out the year planning on kind of three focus areas. One, you know, we had rebranded in 2019, so continuously pushing that out and focusing that in a more meaningful way. Um, but to also, you know, try to, to you know, take advantage of or, or, you know, realize the opportunity and the, and the impact in just banking was, you know, mergers and acquisitions, there's customer impact across the board. So we had had a plan to kind of, you know, take advantage of that, if you will. Um, but then, you know, when all of this happened, similar to what Becky said, do you sound tone deaf, you know, if you're picking up the phone and start, you know, calling on customers in their time of need just didn't feel right to us. So we kind of took a step back uh, in those areas, but in other areas, you know, we had a couple of technology digital banking uh, projects on the slate that we kind of accelerated to make sure that we offered to customers being, you know, Zell, we had launched a Zell, we had just started uh, to launch our online account opening, which isn't necessarily uh, new to the banking world on the consumer side, but it is on the business side, uh, which definitely helped us, especially on the PPP process, the Paycheck, Rote uh, Paycheck Protect Protection Program, to allow customers to be able to, you know, open accounts and, and get the funds that they needed um, without having to come into the branch. So, you know, impact in some ways um, actually helped us in other ways, but certainly um, had to pivot in, in certain certain areas. Absolutely. And Alex, how has the roadmap changed, if at all, uh, over at Toast? Good question. So um, historically, Toast has been a hypergrowth company. And for anyone unfamiliar with the definition of a hypergrowth company, it's defined as the phase of rapid expansion companies experience really when they're scaling. So specifically where a company's compound annual growth rate or CAGR is 40% or greater, um, that's kind of where we've thrived. Last year, we were at 109% there and, and we'll be at a good spot this year. Regardless, uh, we're still focused on customer expansion as well as customer retention. But I would say our biggest shift has been our portfolio of product offerings that we're trying to get out to our customers now just to help them get through all the current struggles that they're seeing. So uh, we've been able to pivot quickly a lot of new digital avenues that we're offering restaurants just to make it safer for them. And obviously, uh, not only help them get through it, but help them thrive with products they might not have been using otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll stay on that topic, Alex. Um, and echo some of the feedback that our fellow panelists have shared about doing the right thing, especially at the beginning of the pandemic and of course still today. And it's clear that the year hasn't gone the way that any of us have planned and there was a feeling at the beginning of the pandemic that it wasn't okay to sell. Um, so how did your organization handle that and at what point did you decide that it was okay to sell again? Good question. Um, first thing that I think about is it's everybody's first pandemic. 
So we're all kind of in this together and everybody has to pivot some kind of way, including our customers, obviously. So it's been hard trying to navigate what's appropriate and what isn't, I think to what Erica was talking about before. Uh, but we really trained our sales team to lead with empathy here. Uh, we serve a vertical that's really been turned upside down. So the first thing we wanna do is help. We wanna ask those questions, how are you doing? What have you done to adjust? And we really armed our team with lots of different tools to help them. Uh, we have a publication called On The Line, and it's a blog that people have uh, subscribed to for a long time. It's one of the more popular blogs within the restaurant industry. Uh, and if you don't mind here, I actually might grab this and show it just so people can see what I'm talking about. Can you see my screen here? Yep. So you can actually see here, we developed this within a month and we gave this out to really the entire restaurant world. You actually have the ability here to type in any restaurant name and their zip code. You can search it and you can buy gift cards from them. And that's really how this website came about. We wanted to make sure that we were giving almost mini loans to restaurants because that's what you're doing when you're buying gift cards. And we offer a digital uh, gift card offering. But you can see up here in the four restaurants tab, we're actually giving them a lot of tools and a lot of articles and knowledge bases on how to get through some of the specific struggles that they're seeing or they've never dealt with before. So if we just went into some of the how-to guides here, uh, you can see how to become a bartender, hire your next uh, star, whoever it might be. But a lot of this is COVID based as well. Uh, which people have come to us and they've said, you know, they love this and they love all of the different knowledge and, and marketing material that we've been able to give out here. Um, so that's really been uh, kind of nice for us to be able to pivot and get that out as quickly and just offer uh, something to our customers where they feel like they're not alone and their technology providers also helping them in other avenues. Yeah, absolutely. And David, um, can you speak to the sales side of things as well? Well, it's funny because I'm an accountant and yeah, I didn't go into accounting to go into sales. Little, little did I know, but, but you know, what, what you find is I like to not think that we do any selling. I like to think we help people. And the way I think we help people is figure out their goals and figure out a way that we can provide the service. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do. We try and have a full range of services that can help you know, our market, which is any, you know, any privately held company uh, and, and, and wealthy families, you know, those are the, that's our market. And because those are our market, our goal, you know, our goal in selling is we have a lot of products that can help them. We were sort of lucky in, in the pandemic when it, when it first started because immediately the PPP program that most people have taken advantage of came up and that helped banks uh, you know, help the banks because everybody had to go through the banks, but virtually all the clients had questions and didn't know what to do. Um, you know, we, we did a, a, you know, we did almost a daily blog on completing, helping, finishing. Every one of my partners, our, our managers, they were all talking to their clients, talking to them, helping them get through this. So I didn't think of it as I was selling to somebody during the pandemic and trying to get them to buy something, uh, you know, as, as if I met them any other time, it's what are your problems? What are your goals? Let me see if I can help you if they're not being met in some other way. So to me, I, I just don't like to think of it as selling. I like to think of it as solving problems, helping people achieve what they need. And, you know, so to me, it, it wasn't, you know, there was, yeah, I didn't want to reach out to people and I realized, wait a minute, they have to hear from me, you know, that they're my customers. I want to make sure if nothing else you're doing okay and you don't need my help, wonderful. If you do, we're here for you. And that's what we said across all of our, of all of our team. You have to reach out, you have to call people, you have to speak to them, you have to ask them what's going on and if there's any way we can help them. And if the answer is no, everything's under control, that's fine. But 90% of the time when you ask somebody if you can help them, there's always something they want. There's always some question you can answer. So to me, that was sort of my, my view of it. it it's not selling, it, it's solving the problem. Absolutely. And so now we've talked about our perspective on, on the business environment right now, but I wanna dig into the buyer perspective a little bit. So Erica and Alex, I'm interested in digging into the changes in buyer behavior that you've noticed over the past couple of months. 
and then what changes in strategy that you've made or you plan to make as a result of those insights. So Erica, why don't you get started? Yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious across, you know, all uh, industries that just digital adoption um, increased kind of across the board, you know, people who who weren't necessarily, you know, open to, to you know, digital banking, online banking, bill pay, those types of things became much more open to the idea. Now, our, our customer base skews a little bit older, um, just historically through our, you know, mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, that's always kind of been, um, I wouldn't say a challenge um, for us, but, you know, people are, you know, set in their ways and, you know, they, they still want to come into the, the, the bank and the branch and, and we certainly want to still see them. Um, but, you know, with obviously when the pandemic hit, people were a little bit more open to it. So we certainly saw shifts um, in digital adoption just across the board. Um, and then, you know, for the folks who, who still wanted to come into the branch and, and they still want to come into the branch, you know, we were there for them there too. You know, we had call ahead banking has set up for them. Anything that we typically wouldn't do through a drive through we made exceptions and we did through the drive through So where the buyer's behavior wasn't necessarily changing, um, we changed our, you know, our operations to, to, to cater to that. So again, go with the theme of, we just need to help the customers right now. We need to be there where they want us to be in their time of need. So, you know, we saw some changes in other areas we didn't see, but then on that, on those, those examples, we, we kind of changed our, our way of thinking. Yeah, and uh, this is an interesting question for me because of the vertical we serve. If you think about restaurants in general, you can have a pop-up stand or you can work with a multi-billion dollar franchise. So it really depends on who the buyer, who the customer is and what their mindset is for their business moving forward. Um, as you can imagine, we had prospects and customers that just wanted to hunker down, weather the storm, didn't want to change anything, almost kind of like the fetal position. But we also had a lot of prospects that reached out to us directly because they wanted to set up digital avenues uh, they wanted to make their business as efficient and as customer centric as possible, as, ac uh, as accessible as possible. Uh, so we've had a lot of hand raisers, which is great. Uh, we had a lot of people that wanted to incorporate new technology and they wanted to, uh, to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, the cool thing there too is um, I think the biggest objection we hear in sales all the time is people don't have enough time, right? That, that's one of the biggest ones. So we know people had a little more time on their hands than they might have uh, otherwise, especially in the restaurant world. Certainly they're trying to pivot, not, not saying they're not busy, but oftentimes when we sit down for a demo, we're able to actually get in there and talk to them and see what they're doing. Um, it makes a lot of sense. So we've actually just had more conversations because people do have a little bit more time. And going back to what David was saying, it's just about having the conversation in the first place. Uh, it's not necessarily trying to sell them from the start, but seeing how they're doing. And then we also offer a lot of digital products that you know have a lot of ROI. So if you're not offering online ordering right now as a restaurant, you're shooting yourself on the foot. 76, per, I think it's 86% of all consumers today have order, ordered online at least one time this month. And 75% of those have all ordered multiple times this month. And those numbers are just way, way up. And it's safer, right? You don't have to exchange money. It's all digitally done. You can pick it up. Um, so all of those things, I, I think, kind of answer that question. Absolutely. Um, and Becky and Alex, you guys both work with smaller businesses um, as well as those mid-sized and enterprise customers. Those small businesses have been hit really disproportionately hard by the pandemic. So what has it been like helping them navigate the challenges of the current business environment? And has this changed the way that you position yourselves as a vendor or a service provider or to, your, to use your term a problem solver? Becky, why don't you get started? Sure. So small businesses, um, you know, tend to act like more like consumers than they do larger organizations. Um, certainly depends on the maturity scale where they are on that curve. But by and large, you, the behavior that we saw from our consumers was very similar to the behavior that we saw coming from the small businesses that we were working with. And a lot of it had to do with wanting and needing consultative support. Um, asking questions. At the end of the day, they're consumers as well. They're living this pandemic, even outside of their business as well. So one of the things that we track um, really um, across the board at CQ is member sentiment through our surveys, through the calls that are coming in. We look at natural language and we're able to tease out what is the sentiment of our call calls that are coming in and the discussions that we're having. And for small businesses in particular, it was interesting to see kind of the trajectory of 
fear and uncertainty quickly switch to nervousness and scared. Um, so we kind of looked at the data and said, we've got to really pivot how we're talking to these small businesses when they're calling in, when they're reaching out to us through social media. I think Alex or, or David mentioned leading with empathy, um, really honing in on that. But before we even got to how we can help them through a line of credit or a relief loan, a lot of it was that consultative one-on-one -on -one advice in a time of uncertainty, how can we walk them through you know, what their options are and just put them at ease a little bit. That it seems incredibly simplistic, um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's really where we've been working with small businesses because their, their needs are incredibly unique based on their business model. Alex just talked about restaurants. There are others that rely on their distribution channel of sale, door, like kind of feet on the street salespeople that have a whole different set of needs. So really the kind of listening and solution-based selling is kind of the approach that, that we've been taking. Absolutely. I don't know if Alex, you wanted to add to that. Um, yeah, um, I think selling into small businesses is certainly a little bit different. Uh, the one thing that I would say here is they kind of, uh, they lack the tools sometimes that you see in some of the mid, mid market to enterprise accounts otherwise. So that's really what we tried to focus on. Simple things like, do you know how to apply for your PPP loan? Uh, how is that going to work? Have you thought about revamping your menu because you're not gonna have as many people come through. You can't order the same amount of food. Like, can we cut down your menu and help with some costs there? And again, it, it's like I said, kind of getting some people out of the fetal position and thinking about what they're going to do differently and if they're open to operating a little bit differently. I've also seen with some of our, I guess, bigger uh, SMB accounts, um, some of the, the groups, the chains, I don't think they're going away at all. I know a lot of people have talked about the doom and gloom of the restaurant industry and what might happen. Um, the way that I see it personally, we'll probably see a lot more ghost kitchens come through and you'll see more people that are operating digitally. Uh, you'll see people and groups, small, small uh, to mid market groups, they're the ones that are willing to change a little bit and use the digital avenues they have, they can operate at a much lower cost. Uh, something else that I think you guys will see soon within restaurants, it's actually a tool that we just rolled out called order and pay at the table. You've probably all been to a restaurant, maybe sat outside somewhere, but you can scan a QR code on the table. Typically that brings up a menu and that's it. So what we've been able to do is put that QR code on the table, you can scan it. You can also order from your phone and pay from your phone. There's no touching pens, there's no touching menus. Um, Typically, rest, uh, you're going to order an extra drink. You might order another modifier, do something like that. And again, for the restaurants, they could cut down maybe on one server. And if they're not paying that server, it pays for you know, that product in itself in a day. But as a consumer, think about the experience that you want. We're trying to show those small, um, the smaller businesses what they're missing otherwise by giving them more enterprise tools. And that's really helped, uh, helped kind of uh, keep us moving. Yeah. That's a great segue because I'm interested, Erica or David, feel free to chime in if there's any difference from how your teams, which also work with mid-sized and enterprise businesses, have operated and approached those types of buyers or clients as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's good>. <laughs> okay, so from, from our perspective, again, you know, I'm going to take the angle from the PPP um, process because that was all we lived and breathed um, and still to, the, to an extent continue to live and breathe. Um, there really wasn't much difference. You know, when that, when that program rolled out, it was everyone calling, how do I apply? Can I apply? Where do I apply? All of the above. Um, and because we didn't have a lot of direction, you know, initially from the SBA, a lot of times, I say a lot of times, but we didn't necessarily know the answers when they were asking the questions. But I think it was important for us to always continuously pick up the phone and call our, our clients and let them know, you know, we're not ignoring you. Um, we don't. We don't necessarily know all the details yet, but this is where we think that the direction that we're going. Um, so we ended up actually starting the application process internally um, before before the SBA opened, you know, their portal. So we were taking applications manually across across the board. I mean, we had folks working literally into like, you know one two a.m. at night taking applications, um, and I think it was just important that we always continuously stayed in contact with our customers, even if it was, you know, just to put them in ease is, you know, you're not behind the bar, you don't, you're not missing anything. There just hasn't been any information um, that's been sent out there yet. 
Um, and I think that was extremely uh, important for our customers, again, just to kind of put them at ease because no one really knew what was going on. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, we did over, you know, a thousand PPP loans and about, you know, close to 750 of, uh, of them were under the 150,000 limit. So, I mean, it was, it was the smaller guys that, that we were helping uh, ultimately. And, you know, that's kind of our focus area is the small and medium sized businesses. So I don't think it, it, how we, how we handled it and how we, you know, conversed with our customers wasn't necessarily different depending on their sizes. Just again, being a sounding board, being there. Um, you know, a lot of the feedback that we got from some of the, our customers were the larger banks, they weren't even getting answers back. You know, it was, it was like an automated answer. So just being there, being the sounding board, holding their hand, it's going to be all right. You know, as soon as we know something, you'll know something. And, and to not, you know, leave the customers in the dark was huge for us. Um, and has, has actually paid out for us in the long run because, you know, now we're seeing customers calling us just because they were just, you know, super appreciative of how we handled the process. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of paying for, paying for itself in the long run for sure. Yeah. What we, what we really did is, is sped up our digital transformation by three or four years, I'm thinking. Um, historically, we've always had a number of clients that adopted whatever digital opportunities to work with us they had. They'd adopt them right away. But then there was, you know, somebody mentioned the older clients, people that aren't as technologically savvy that, you know, they just, I, w I still want it in paper. And well, all of a sudden, nobody actually wants anything in paper where it's been touched by somebody else. So, you know, luckily we had had, you know, some programs that have been put in place to avoid that, which, you know, we liked, we'd like 100% compliance with that and probably we're at 50 or 60%. So now we're at 95%. You know, and then another part of our business is you know, auditing and going, you know, which is going out and looking, you know, working at a client's office for, you know, a week or two weeks at a time with a team of people. Well, you can't have a time, a team of people working together. You can't go out to a client's office, which may or may not be open. Uh, and the reality is, well, the reality is everything's electron was electronic then anyway. People were walking in the uh, in a conference room and handing sticks over so you could put it on your computer. Well, you know, you found out you actually can do all that remotely. The hard part is keeping that personal interaction up while you're doing that. And to me, that that's almost it's not the biggest challenge because I, I don't know it feel, feels very natural to me, but it's a thing to be careful of as you are able to work more and more remotely and touch clients less and less, you know, take the digital opportunity to touch them more. I always go, I have a number of clients I'm in Baltimore, I have a number of clients over in the DC area. And I was like, yeah, I would go over to DC in an afternoon and try and see two. I'd go to see the one that set up the meeting and I always say, I gotta see another person while I'm over there. So I'm not wasting an entire afternoon. You know, and I, and I remember one of the first days of COVID, I met five DC clients one afternoon, all remotely, all like this. And so to me, you know, the transformation is we're doing more things digitally. You know, we were able to put in new processes digitally that allowed us to interact more efficiently with clients. The idea of, you know, sending in checks to pay bills. Well, you know, we had moved to electronic we had set up electronic portal in advance of this all happening. And now we said, okay, even though we know most, most of my partners don't like to have people change the way they do things. It's working fine, don't change it. Well, you know what? We didn't have people in our office to handle the checks that come in the mail. So we said, okay, we're, we're rolling this out. We're gonna roll it out to virtually everybody. We're gonna put in play the opportunity for an ACH credit card trade. You know, whatever was necessary so that we could process our business efficiently and be you know, less touched. And I think that works. Let's just not forget about the personal touch that's really important in, in working with any clients. Absolutely. Um, and switching gears here a little bit, Alex and Becky, how has the role of marketing in your organization changed throughout the pandemic um, as a B2B marketer? We wore a lot of hats last year. We're wearing different hats this year. 
So I wanted to see, um, Alex, we can start with you. If your marketing team's priorities or how they contribute to the growth and success of the organization and your clients' businesses have changed a little bit. Definitely changed a little bit. Um, like I was saying earlier, we rolled out that tool rally for restaurants and that's been pretty cool to, to be able to provide some extra tools there and show some of the initiatives that we're working on to, to get people back on their feet and make sure that they have the tools to succeed otherwise. Uh, we've had to scale back in other areas. We were doing a lot of uh, on-site events. I'm not sure if anybody here has heard of Food for Thought, but we were literally going from city to city, uh, putting on these events at big restaurants. I think we did it at, uh, at Raw Bar last year and had you know a couple hundred people that came out. That hurts, you know, like having um, that presence and having customers come out and being able to talk to prospects in person. So we've had to cut back there, but where we're, where we've cut back, we've been able to pivot again digitally uh, and really do some things with customers, do some other webinars. Um, we um, haven't been able to get on site to teach people the system as much as we would like. So we've been able to set up um, very similar webinars to this, make sure people feel comfortable using the system and otherwise. So again, it's just a pivot. It's, it's everything that you can think about doing in person otherwise. Uh, where can we spend those dollars otherwise to make sure that our reach is still there People are still hearing us. Uh, and again, this is the new normal for what it is. If, uh, if you don't know how to use Zoom at this point, you're, you're probably in trouble otherwise. So the good news is uh, SMB customers, which um, I typically serve, they're open to that. They wanna do that and they understand the importance of it as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of the other part with us shifting. We need our customers to shift too. And it's kind of nice that they've been able to do that. I can't speak for everybody else here, but that's, that's been nice. Yeah, so um, Laura, do you want me to just dive right into this one too? Um, really? We, um, I think from a, how it's impacted the marketing team, at least at CQ, it's almost that marketing became even more so the epicenter of where all of the communication was going to and coming from. Because in the beginning, in any sort of crisis, it's coordination of messaging, right, through all channels. And that became a little bit cumbersome when the, the, you know, the story was changing by the minute, you know, are we going to open the branches? Or are they going to stay closed? Um, are we going to extend our call center hours due to the demand? Um, what's the member, member sentiment at any given time? What is, what are people saying on social media? Just everything just came through um, marketing. And we, even today, it's much less regular, but for a while there, we had daily pandemic calls, which was a cross-functional team that was just constantly talking about what is happening today, what is the latest news, and how can we message that to our members? Because a lot of the channels that they were used to engaging with us in, going to the branch, calling the call center, became a little bit tougher to get through to. So emails that we sent out, what we posted on social media became even more important than perhaps they had in the past. So I think there's an element of we almost became sort of this general contractor of what was happening over the last um, several months. But then in addition, the other piece, I think that it's really tested the team's ability to think outside the box. How do you open a new branch without having people there? Um, and, you know, outside of thinking outside the box, how quickly can you work? So putting new pages on the website around PPP loans or around, um, virtual branch options, things like that. Things that we normally had time to plan out and properly launch became, we need this now overnight. So there was a little bit of kind of putting a fire under everyone, but I think it really showed, you know, what we were able to do. Um, and the team really was able to shine through it all. So it's, there's a lot of really great stories in there, a lot of hard work, a lot of pivoting um, as everyone keeps um, using, but also just really good stories of what can be done when you, are really up against the wall. Yeah, and I, I can definitely echo that sentiment of the marketing team becoming kind of the central nerve center for all of yeah. your coronavirus operations. Yeah. Um, we found that one particularly important audience for us from a communication standpoint was our team members. And um, our marketing team has done yep. a spectacular job working with the leadership team, again, on a daily basis, sometimes in the early days on an hourly basis, making sure that our operations um, and our people were, were okay, were feeling yeah. prepared, that we felt like that was a really important audience for us, just as if not more important than our, our client and our prospect audience as well. That's a great point, Laura. And I, I am remiss to even say that, that the internal communications was more important than it ever has been before. 
And so we even we're giving thought to like every month, every other month, I think our employees are receiving a packet in the mail, a little box, a little gift. And it started from hand sanitizers and a CQ mask. Then it became um, kind of like little CQ type things they can put in their home office, but a way to still talk to them and communicate with them in a different way than we've had to think about in the past. So I totally agree that internal communications is just just as important. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. We kind of came the the just the communicators across the board, which we typically have, but I would agree, but it was like, and we need this tomorrow. And you know, or we need this in an hour. We need to get this out, or we're sending something externally, so we need to communicate it internally first. So let's roll. Um, so there was a lot of that, but also too, um, you know, again, because our, our 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 lenders can't get out and you know, in a normal way that they would, you know, they're not going to events at night, our sales folks aren't you know, out there networking and, and getting in front of people. So they, I think they've been looking at marketing too. And again, on the, on the commercial side, typically, uh, Becky, to your point, um, you know, on the retail side, the consumer side, it, smaller businesses act more like consumers. So we kind of know what to do there. But on the commercial side, you know, they typically, it's more relationship focused. It's those, you know, picking up the phone and talking to their customers. So when they're not able to get out in front of their customers and meet and, you know, from a sales perspective, now they're kind of looking at us like, Hey, um, you got any ideas? <laughs> so how do we keep getting out? How do we get our name out there? How do we make sure that we're staying in front of, um, you know, prospects and our customers when, when we can't physically be out there anymore? So um, it's, it's, it's certainly been interesting. Uh, and that's a great segue to my next question for David. Conferences, events, face-to-face -face meetings, happy hour, meeting for coffee, that they all play a huge role in bringing in new leads. It's it's just the way that it is. So how has the loss of those in-person opportunities or at least the change in the opportunity changed the way that you network or bring in new leads? Well, you know, I, th I think the majority of our business comes from our existing clients and existing contacts. And so from my perspective, I can, I've seen more clients in the last five months than I see in the average year. I've seen them like this, not in person, but that's okay, because I really see them, I see their expressions, I can get the feeling for how they are. So I think, you know, and this is across the team, that, you know, number one, you can see all the people you want to. In terms of the groups, um, you know, we, we, you know, professional organizations, well, they still want to market too. So the lawyers that we would have firm on firm events with, well, they still want to do that too, and they're as nervous about what to do as, as we might be. So, so we're doing the same thing. We're, you know, this afternoon we have a firm on firm and, you know, a half dozen of our, our guys will meet a half dozen of their guys. No, we're not meeting in the bar. Uh, we've tried to, you know, everybody can bring their drink to, to, to their table and that'll be fine. Um, you know, then, you know, but when to the groups, I think is the harder part of it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of organizations, uh, we have a big healthcare practice and there's a big annual healthcare conference and our group has developed a certain specialty uh, survey that they present that's really, uh, you know, something that's really anticipated by the group. So, you know, the, the answer is we still needed to get the survey done. We're just going to be presenting it to a group of people. We'll have a webinar to present it to the people that, that would otherwise be attending that organization. We'll do more direct marketing to those people than we might otherwise have done knowing they would just come and see us at, at an event. So, you know, and, and I, that's what I find most of the organizations are doing. They're pivoting. Yes, there was a month or two of, I'm not sure what to do when you're purely a organization that pulls people together. But after a month or two, you go, I need to get my people together. Or I'm pretty much out of business. So that's what they needed to do it. And all of us need to meet those people. So to me, it's just, you know, it's changed, but it's really the same. And there's certain places where you say, how better can we meet them? Because we're not going to see them in person. How can we make sure we follow up? I actually think it just forced better digital communications than we've ever done before. And that'll carry forward as we're done, hopefully one day this pandemic. Right, yeah, and I love the idea of leading with that value added content, that research, that those survey results. And I also really love the idea of leading with data. And on that note, according to research that our team pulled from McKinsey, uh, B2B buyer preferences over the past 
really five, 10 years have shifted away from traditional interactions towards more digital self-service tools. And they're more interested than ever than completing in completing a lot of the sales process themselves, gathering that information, um, finding out your differentiators, assessing competitors, et cetera. So has your team noticed, noticed that this trend is happening to you guys and undergone any sort of digital transformation? I know some of you guys have mentioned that. Erica, why don't you get started? And then I'd love to hear from Alex and Becky as well. Yeah, so we, we started out, out uh, the year pr prior to the pandemic hitting with focusing more on, you know, investing in, in digital technologies. Um, so if anything, it's, it's definitely um, speeded that process up. Uh, like I mentioned, we had, we had launched um, Zelle in May. Um, we had launched online account opening right around when the pandemic hit. Um, and then are currently working on um, revamping our online and uh, mobile banking platform to allow customers to have a little bit more self-service options, particularly on the business uh, side of things. So it's, it's certainly speeded up the process. And I think because of the positive um, reaction that we've gotten to our customers on on all of the things that we've done thus far, I think it's just kind of confirmed that we were already heading in the right direction that we need to keep, we need to keep on doing that and just investing in just the, the, the client experience across the board. And a lot of that is, is digital now, but, it, but in a way that it kind of supplements still the face to face, if you will, even if it's through a screen, um, relationships that we have with our customers. And we're never gonna be a company that it's like, oh, go do that on your own, go click this button. Like, we'll, we'll never be that way. Like that's kind of our, we will always be hands on in a way, but to, to, to leverage technology to kind of supplement in times like this, where it just makes it a little bit easier for the customer to open the account online, not have to come into the branch, but we're still there for the, for, from the advisory standpoint and the handholding standpoint. So I think if anything, it's just kind of confirmed what we were already doing um, and then we'll continue to go down that path. Great, and Alex, what about you guys? Have you invested a little bit more in that education to help people move themselves a little bit further down that purchase funnel? Absolutely, I, I kind of think about it two ways. There's a sales side to this and then there's a support side. Uh, obviously supporting you know tens of thousands of restaurants that are on our platform uh, with what is actually pretty complicated software with everything we do, we wanna make sure that they have the resources to be successful in the first place. Um, so we have really put a lot of money and effort into our, uh, our support centers uh, digitally. So if you think about Google in general, it's kind of what I refer to it as. It's like the, the Google of Toast, it's called Toast Central. You can literally type in any keyword and it's gonna come, come up with some kind of article and some kind of video of somebody showing the action of what you would need to do within the system to you know, figure out whatever you need to. That takes uh, a lot of effort off of our support folks so they don't have to field those calls. Um, obviously it's a, a time saver, a money saver otherwise. So we've really put a lot into Toast Central to make sure that we're giving our customers the, uh, the experience, one that they want, because I think most people today uh, look for something online first before they wanna call support otherwise. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that. Uh, on the sales side, I would say we're actually rolling out an e-commerce platform. Uh, I think it's supposed to be next week. So customers will actually be able to go to our website and purchase hardware. They won't have to deal with uh, the horrible salespeople. I'm kidding. But um, it's just a better experience, right? If you can click a button on Amazon and you know have it shipped to you right away, we don't want to have to have two or three people touch that. We don't ha want to have interactions. We don't want to have DocuSigns otherwise. Uh, it should be a much a more seamless experience for our customers. And that's what's expected today anyway. Um, so there is um, a good bit of money going to our e-commerce platform there as well. Great. That's, that's interesting that e-commerce be, be commerce type of, uh, type of uh, dichotomy there. Um, so Becky, um, I'm interested to hear how you guys have been finding the right mix of digital channels to meet user needs. Yeah, so we think about it really as channel of choice. So, um, you know, I think in banking in general is a considered, what I would can call a considered purchase, something that businesses don't take lightly. So it's not um, necessarily buying something from Amazon. You liken it more to choosing your healthcare provider or choosing, you know, these are, these are decisions that people don't come by necessarily as lightly. So I think what we've worked, been really working and struggling through, I think like a lot of other financial institutions is you tend to either have this full service in branch experience, which is a little bit of the older school mentality, 
or you've got the fully self-serve online banking, open your accounts online. What we're trying to figure out is what's that right mix of giving the digital experience to the extent that the customer or member wants to take it, but within that same experience, have the option to chat with somebody, have the option to have somebody co-browse with you and show you how to do something on your computer or video chat with somebody. But making it really kind of the outside in perspective is giving the businesses the choice on how they want to act, interact with us. And it's on us and where we've been really putting our emphasis in is making sure we've got all of those channels available to the member so that we can help kind of bridge the gap between fully in person, fully hand holding, fully consultative to totally self serve. It's sort of finding that middle ground. Um, that's, that's where we've been spending a lot of our energy. Yeah, that's a great point about channel of choice. Um, to wrap up before we, we get some questions from the audience, I wanna ask one more question to each of our panelists and David, we'll start with you. What's one way that the pandemic has impacted Gross Mendelssohn's long-term future or the future of B2B marketing and growth for the better? Um, I, I think it's, it's forced us to do more, to do even more digital marketing, to get out in a more digital way. But I, I think for our business, which is professional relationships for the most part, um, it's reminding people you have to reach out and talk to your clients. And there are many ways to do that. And doing it in person by video is just as good as any other method. Um, I think we've done much better in terms of generating even more content than we ever had before for people that maybe don't have that full network. What do they do? How do they get one started? And well, some of the things you can do is become more of an expert in something. So how do we develop our people better? And so, you know, we've pushed them, you be the writers of the content that becomes our content marketing. And from that, you'll begin to develop opportunities you make sure you reach out to the people you work with. And through those reaching out, you know, you're, you're there, that problem solver, that ability to listen to, to what's going on in their world. And that's really how professionally you begin to develop that relationship. And you know, the marketing department has done a great job of backing us up in that regard, publishing things that make us look much better than I would ever make us look. And, you know, and providing a place where people, what people do is they still get someone says, you should go talk to Gross Mendelssohn and Dave Goldner. You know, they go to our website and they want to see what that means. You know, they want to see what we look like. And so us knowing that they go and they see the right picture of us and to be there and say, hmm, not only to see a picture, you know, I'm glad a few years ago we started doing video much more as, as part of how we're delivering information. Now that's become second nature of how we deliver information. So always trying to be on the, on the cutting edge of getting that information and content out in the public so that when they're ready to buy, hopefully they'll find us. Great. And Erica, what about you? I think on the marketing side, moving forward, that just as a company, we're just going to be more open to just trial and error and trying new things. Um, you know, there's not necessarily a playbook on how to market through a pandemic out there, at least certainly not one that I'm aware of. Um, so just being able to, to try different things, you know, we haven't really in the past dabbled in webinars and doing them, but that's something that we're now we're talking about now we're much more open to because just the way that we're going to have to get in front of people for, for a while. So I think just the overall concept of, of, of trying new things, um, see how they work, tweaking, seeing what sticks and, and moving forward. Um, and we've done that a little bit in the past, but I think it's just across the board, across the company, people are just, um, just open to trying new things, you know, just in, in, in giving, and we've talked about this, there were some people that, you know, never been on a Zoom call before, never done this before. And now that's just how they get in front of their customers. That's how they talk to their colleagues. Um, so it's second nature to them. So they're just much more open to, to, to trying these things. And I think that's going to be uh, super helpful for us uh, moving forward. Great. And we'll turn it over to Becky. Yeah, so I think 
one of the there's sort of two big I think good moments for for us coming out of the silver linings, if you will. One is I think we've never been more aligned from a strategy perspective at our organization. This has forced us to think really hard about our resources at the macro level, time and people and energy, and making sure that they're all rowing in the same direction. Um, that's incredibly great and helpful moving forward. Um, and then this, the second thing, coming from the strategy person, it's going to be a really soft thing, but the the ability to connect with the employees in a very different way, seeing family members pop into Zooms, and you almost got to know your colleagues at a different level now that everybody's at home. And I think that just helps morale to the extent that you, we still want to get together. Um, that's absolutely always going to be there, especially with marketers who thrive on energy of other people. But you know, I do think it, it's it's brought us closer in, in a bit of a way too. So those are my two. Great. And finally, Alex. Yeah, as, uh, as I think about, um, you know, the prospects we go after and the customers we serve otherwise, typically you're still gonna find a lot of people that are, are reluctant to turn towards technology. If there's any good that's come out of this, it almost has forced uh, the hand of a lot of different people to adapt and to change and to make sure that they're doing things differently with their business. Um, it's kind of hard to believe, but I would say 35 to 40% of all of our prospects and customer well, prospects today are still using legacy equipment, which basically means they're connected to a server, which means they can't see any of their data outside of their restaurant. And if you guys can imagine that today, trying to do your job and the only place that you can do it is sitting in your workplace. Um, I use the analogy of having to use a rotary phone or being connected to the wall instead of using a cell phone. It just blows my mind. Uh, and even then, like five to 10% of all restaurants are still using pen and paper. So how do you even keep track of stuff? Uh, regardless, I have loved uh, that it's forced some people to go into digital avenues. Um, and it's made selling a little bit easier because we have thought of ourselves as the leader in restaurant technology. And um, that's certainly made it a little bit easier to sell. That's great. Um, so that concludes the structured portion of this webinar, but we do have some really good questions from our audience. So I'm going to put these out to the panelists and anyone can tackle these. So the first one's from Jim and he completely agrees with leading with empathy and consultative support. At what point did you all start charging for your advice and work and did you extend discounts for your services at all? I'll take that one from the start. Um, we did offer a credit to all of our customers. Uh, we offered a month's worth of software and to date we're still offering three months free of online ordering to any new customers that sign up with us. Um, we also don't have any commissions built into our products. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with how companies like DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub work, but they typically work off of a commission structure. So uh, if you order $100 from Grubhub, yeah, it's great, it goes to that restaurant otherwise, but they're taking about a 30% commission on that. Uh, so I would also encourage everybody to think about how you're ordering. Try and order through uh, either a direct website or a platform like Toast. Like we have the Toast takeout app where you can actually see some restaurants that use our platform otherwise. Um, but getting back to the, are we charging otherwise, the, the question's no. Uh, we've always kind of had that consultative approach. Um, we're really just charging people once they, they sign up for the service and start using us. Um, but yeah, leading with empathy there, that, that's certainly the first way that we wanted to approach those conversations. Um, and then our CEO did send out a message to our entire customer base, letting them know about the, uh, the credits. That's great. Um, the next question is from Colleen. Is there something looking back that you wish you had done differently during the first half of the year? I can, I can take this one. Uh, just, and it's the smallest thing that I always, I always kick myself for. Um, we did not do branded masks from the, from the kick go. It's the smallest thing that I still kick myself for. Um, you know, we wanted to get masks out to folks and we were, you know, paranoid that there was some short supply and we wanted to get them out there and we wanted them to feel safe. And they came up and do we do branded masks? And I was like, I don't know. You know, we, we don't want to take advantage of, we don't want to use masks as a branding opportunity. And um, certainly uh, kicking myself uh, for that, that small decision. That, that one always pops up into my head. <laughs> well, there's definitely still time for that. <laughs> yes, we'll be in this for a while. <laughs> All right, um, I think we have time for a couple more. So this one's from Sue. How are you planning your community support and sponsorships for 2021? Are you shying away from in-person events like galas and walks? 
Um, we did have another question to that, in that similar vein. So how did you change your plan this year for community support, sponsorship, CSR? So the, the things that we have, we've always supported, we're gonna continue to support. I mean, it was fun to go to a gala. It was fun to attend. Well, the good thing is golf, golf tournaments can still go on. It's one of the few events that you can still have and have some fun at. But you know, for most of the, as as a firm, we're going to support all the all the things we have always supported um, because we think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, the the one part that seems hard to me is I think some of the best team building stuff we we do is when we do community outreach together, go spend a day at X or Y or Z, and and help them volunteer the volunteer days. And I'm not you know I, I don't I don't see how that can actually happen. But, uh, and, that, and that's sad because the, the one part that, that to me is worse about this, the best thing that happened is the increased communication we had within the firm. The worst part is somehow we're losing a piece of the culture by not being together as much as we always were. So still, I'm still trying to figure that part out. I, I've got one, one very quick thing on the volunteerism piece. Obviously as a credit union, we're really big on the community and volunteering. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in October is basically a, a month of kindness and we're kicking off with a day of kindness and because we can't get the group all together to do some charitable activity, we're actually sending kindness kits to all of our employees that have various things that they can be doing in their own communities with their own families to help perpetuate kindness and um, make some actions that might, you know, collectively do something greater for the community. So we're trying to get really creative about how we can still get that feel of volunteering, um, but in a very safe, um, confined space. Awesome. Yeah, shout out to the nonprofits out there, the community organizations. There are lots of companies like ours looking for digital ways to get involved. And the month of kindness sounds like a great format to do that in. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one's from Vicki, and she wants to know how you see your marketing budget changing in 2021. Oh, boy. This is a tough one. When will you go into planning? We're in planning. I submitted my budget last week. Um, and I don't think, I don't see it being impacted um, incredibly greatly. I think we still have the same goals that we always have um, and it may be even more so. I think this is gonna be an incredibly challenging year because all of those folks, small businesses and consumers that have been deferring their loans and been pushing off those payments are all going to come due um, in 2021. So I think it's going to be a tough year all around, but from a budget standpoint for marketing, we're still investing in the same areas. Yeah, I, I would expect that you know, our, our budget is set and we're continuing with all the same programs we had before. Um, we, we don't really expect to, to decrease it. We, you know, we're, we're always looking for new opportunities, new places that we, that we can that we can do stuff. But, you know, I think by using the, the digital platforms and having more people in our teams involved in using the platforms, that that really is the opportunity to increase our spend by, you know, the investment of the time that people have. Great. Well, thank you so much to all four of our panelists, Erica, Alex, Becky, and David, and all of you for tuning in to today's webinar that wraps up our Q&A time. But for those of you who still have some questions for our panelists or for us at MindGrub, we will be sending you an email next week with both the recording of today. And feel free to reach out to us anytime. We'd love to continue the conversation on one of our favorite topics. Thank you again to each of our panelists for being so generous with their expertise. Here's our information one more time. We encourage you to stay connected with MindGrub and to check out what's new at Gross Mendelssohn, Howard Bank, CQ, and at Toast. So right about now, um, we will, um, here's a window with our website. So feel free to explore some of the work we've done here at MindGrub or check out our previous virtual speaker series events over on our blog. I'll be sending out a, a recording sometime next week. So keep an eye out in your inbox. And in the meantime, please make sure to whitelist our email so it doesn't get caught in your spam filter. Thanks again for joining us today. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.